wonderful to be here with you for session one of this learning series. Um, it's been organized by the Global Council for Science and the Environment, or GCSE, and the Land Peace Foundation. My name is Laura Weiland, and I'm part of the GCSE team. I know that many of you are familiar with GCSE, whether you're part of the membership community or um, if, you're, if you're with us during the conference, um, the annual conference in January. But for others, I just wanted to give a little bit of, of context because um, you may have found the learning series through some other way. So the Global Council for Science and the Environment is a non-governmental organization established in 1990, which engages scientists, educators, policymakers, business leaders, and officials at all levels of government with the mission of advancing the use of science to inform environmental decision making. So when decision making processes um, can take into account the latest science and knowledge, the resulting solutions to environmental challenges are better for people and for the planet. And at this last GCSE conference in January, we began a discussion exploring questions related to different knowledge uh, different ways of knowing, and among other things, how deeper understanding and collaboration between indigenous science and ways of knowing and Western approaches to knowledge and learning when fully valued together could actually lead to better informed policy decision making. So it has been absolutely wonderful to see the high level of interest and number of people engaged in this work. And um, there's a lot of important context that would be obviously very helpful to go into in a much deeper way. So we're incredibly happy to partner with the Land Peace Foundation to bring you this learning series as a follow-up to the talks and discussion that Sherry Mitchell and Darren Ranko led up in January at the 2021 annual GCSE conference. Um, I'd like to thank the GCSE team, Sherry and Darren, our guest presenters, and um, you know all the collaboration effort that went into organizing this virtual series. Um, we're hoping that this is, can be a way to continue and open up a conversation and a shared learning space over the next several months and after. So I have a couple of logistics to go over before I turn it over to them. Um, we also wanted to thank the Omega Institute for their support of this initiative. And, um, and so we're holding this in webinar format, which just means that um, you can, if you wanna put anything in the chat for panelists, you're welcome to put comments, but please use the, the Q&A function um, that's going to be where you can really um, put in questions throughout the, this time and we'll get to as many of them as we can in the second part of the, um, of the session today. So um, I think other than that, um, we're just looking to see if there's other things. Um, we've opened this series up um, free of charge even beyond the GCSE community. So please, you know, afterwards, feel free to share this with other colleagues or, or people that you know that might be interested. And so again, I want to thank you for joining us. And I would like to turn it over to Sherry and Darren to um, begin. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Laura. Quay, Guanade, hello and welcome. Uh Basilda and Obama Gawasus and Open Wapskewi Nagakakagus Nilti Bayek. Um Nilita Hazio and Diane. my name in my language is Wanahomu Gwasit. Uh, I am from the Penobscot Nation. My family is Bear Clan from the Penobscot Nation and Crow Clan from the Passamaquoddy tribe at Zubayak. And I'm very happy to be able to be here with you today. Uh, Darren and I are trying to, uh, to move through these uh, introductory comments as quickly as possible so that we can get to the discussion with, D with Dina, um, uh, which we're very excited about. And we're very, um, very happy to be able to have this opportunity to come back to GCSE and to further the conversation that we began in January. And so as we began, I think it's important to understand uh, why we have agreed to offer this series. Um, as indigenous people and as scholars and practitioners in the fields of science, law, um, and education, uh, we each have direct experience with the many ways that science has been used throughout history to paint a distorted view of indigenous peoples. Um, and our ways of being and ways of knowing. Uh, we certainly understand that racially based science has been used to dehumanize and diminish indigenous peoples. Uh, in the arts of the larger society, uh, we see it in everything from cartoons to historical depictions of us. 
um, and from the early days of scientific exploration, uh, beginning with the now deeply disturbing field of racial science, uh, our, our entire way of being um, and our ways of knowing have certainly been diminished. Uh, and of course, we recognize that research is always influenced by the biases and beliefs of the researcher, no matter how diligent they may be about their methodologies. Uh, and this is especially true when those beliefs, um, the beliefs that are associated with those biases are viewed as an unspoken prerequisite for entry into the academy, which has certainly been true about the racial superiority that has been assumed by, the, by those rooted within the violent culture. Uh, and I want you to note that I didn't say dominant because the word dominant still holds some kind of connotation of superiority. And the truth is really that it was, it's cultural violence that has been imposed upon us. And so as a result of these biases, um, these uh, racist ideologies have been used to uplift and centralize aberrant, really insane in some ways thinking um, about uh, indigenous peoples and the exploitation of indigenous peoples. And more importantly for this group, I think, is that it has led to the creation of an exclusive framework that has bolstered a very narrow um, school of thought and relegated indigenous knowledge and other ways of knowing and being to obscurity. And I think that the, the purposeful degrading of, of these other forms of knowledge by mainstream governments, academics, and scientists has led to very distorted ideas about um, our intellect as indigenous peoples uh, and has created countless stereotypical myths about our ways of being. And so, uh, you know, for instance, because we didn't share European ideas about land ownership, we were considered primitive because we had no desire to place the sources of our survival, what are called natural resources into the stream of commerce. We were viewed as ignorant. Um, and because our value system was based on relationships and kinship and not currency, we were seen as lacking the capacity to live civilized lives. Uh, and ironically, it is these very same ways of knowing and being um, that are now being sought by mainstream science and academics, scholars, um, and certainly environmentalists uh, around the world in order to help us to avoid this rapid descent uh, uh, into extinction that we're all heading toward uh, and to address the, the incredible violence that has been imposed upon our planet. Um, and so the, this series seeks to open doors between indigenous and Western scientific thought so that we can begin discussions that are needed to build bridges of understanding um, between these two ways of knowing and ways of being so that we can actually rise up to the occasion that we're all being called to to help um, to save our planet. And so with that in mind, uh, we come together today. And so those are the only comments I'm going to, I'm going to offer at the beginning here. And I think that the rest of it will unfold from there. Uh, and from for now, I just want to introduce my colleague, um, Dr. Darren Ranko. Uh, Dr. Darren Ranko is the chair of the Native Studies program at the University of Maine. Uh, he is also uh, co-facilitator of the Wabanaki Leadership Institute. He is uh, one of the leaders of the Indigenous Ways Program, which is a science and math um, program uh, through the University of Maine. He's probably one of the most um, well-respected scholars in Indian country, uh, in my opinion, and in the opinion of many others. And uh, it's been an honor uh, for me to have worked with him over the past several years. And so, uh, Darren, Thank you, Sherry. And um, those words are kind of for me. Uh, lots of mutual respect um, for you and your work, Sherry, and, and for the GCS uh, uh, team to bring all of us together today. I, I wanna just do a, um, a couple of uh, pieces of where, where we were and uh, kind of build out from the Chafee lecture and sort of how we got to having this series and and you know what's phenomenal is I think the response the response by um, uh, everyone that that was at the Chafee lecture and the leadership of uh, GCSE um, has really been uh, made me realize that we're in the state the, the right place at the right time and I think this shows a real shift in effort um, from 
the collective work around um, environment and science and climate change and where, we, where we've been and where we need to go. Um, one thing I pointed out uh, at the Chafee lecture was that there really need to be multiple zones of engagement around indigenous knowledge and experience to, to do this work in a, in, in, in a good way. Uh, for me, it, it's uh, the first phase, and this is very important, and this is sort of what we're starting to do with uh, GCSC, um, is the, in, the institutional, dealing with institutional legacies uh, of exclusion and to really center and give um, uh, a lot of space and recognition for the kinds of knowledge and, and frameworks that, that have been ignored or, or silenced through a variety of institutional and other institutional uh, means. Um, and I think that having clear leadership commitment to, to those is really important. And that's, that's what you all have uh, from the leadership. Um, um, Michelle and others, Katie, have been super, super supportive of taking you know, uh, kind of a chance, but taking a real uh, deeper bite out of, out of what we have to offer. The second space, and these next two are sort of interrelated, and Sherry mentioned this in terms of my bio, is that we need to uh, think about the zone of engagement around research and really what collaborative research is and how that works uh, across uh, different epistemologies and knowing and, and science, but also in lieu of these past histories of scientific racism and colonial legacies uh, of research, uh, where it's been an extraction just like other horrible forms of extraction. And then the last space of, of engagement, and this is also part of um, uh, today's work is pedagogy, you know, really creating space for other ways of knowing and the way that we teach and understand the world and um, really uh, our collective success, Native and Indigenous and non-Native and non, -Native and non -Indigenous, is really dependent upon these better pedagogies of, of inclusive um, knowledge systems. So for us, and that's what I talked about at the Chafee lecture, and for us, uh, hearing your very vibrant response to what we had to say then, we, we recognized that there were three areas. Everything is threes with me. It must be my um, forced Catholic upbringing. Um, uh, these, uh, the, the three areas that we really were able to dig down and, and create this, these three sessions and then a fourth kind of um, learning and engagement session is um, we recognized we needed a, a deeper cut on the ongoing uh, colonial and racist legacies of science and how this influences um, what's happening in Indian country today around uh, climate and environmental issues. And Dina is, and I'll introduce her in a little bit, she's a world expert on that. Um, the next session uh, will be Kyle Poas White, and he's a, a real you know, expert on the ways of understanding and communicating indigenous science and, and the relationships embedded in it, as well as its relation to other forms of knowledge. And then our last session with the Maori scholar, Linda Tuai Smith um, is about the possibilities of partnerships that truly center indigenous knowledges and experiences. So we really wanna go from, and quite honest, the, the, the first session probably will be the, the, you know, in some ways more difficult than, than the others because it's, it's, a, it's an unearthing, a, a, a legacy um, that many of us as the Western trained scientists have participated in and maybe unwittingly, you know, added to or, or, or and, and sustained and engaged in the forms of, 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 of violence that, that Sherry uh, talked about by just our mere training and the way that we've done our work. Um, so I, I just wanna end it there as my pivot point to introduce Dina. And uh, I mean, I could say so much about Dina's work. Um, Dina Jillia Whitaker, uh, she's a Coville Confederated Tribes descendant, is really a renowned scholar, educator, journalist, and author in American Indian studies and environmental issues. Um, she co-authored, along with Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz, the, the quite popular book, All the Real Indians Died Off, and 20 Other Myths About Native Americans. Uh, she's an adjunct professor of American Indian studies at Cal State San Marcos. Um, what I want, also want to really highlight, and, and this is just so critical, is that her most recent book, which I and many others have, uh, uh, have been teaching since it's, it came out, is called As Long as Grass Grows, The Indigenous Fight for Environmental Justice from Colonization to Standing Rock. Uh, that was published in 2019 by Beacon Press. 
There she applies her expertise in environmental justice to create a foundation for thinking about what environmental justice policy means in Indian country. It's uh, the only book of its kind. It is a primer for governments, NGOs, uh, other organizations uh, who are engaging uh, indigenous peoples, environmental and climate justice work. Um, she's won many awards for these writings and the too, too many to, to list. So without further ado, I wanna, I wanna hand it over to Dina to begin our session today. Thank you, Darren, um, for that very generous and amazing introduction. Why peace nak silku isquis dina Julia Whitaker is makalak squis nak pus, and uh, I am, as Darren said, a descendant of the Colville Confederated Tribes, the Sinaiq Band. I am uh, our in our um, reservation is is on the in Washington State. And um, I'm related through, if I was to introduce you to uh, myself to you traditionally in my community, I would tell you that I am related through the Desitel family, the, um, the Finleys and the Charettes and, and, uh, and, and other families, old Colville families. And this way I establish my, um, uh, my accountability to the community as, as somebody who is who I say I am. So this is really important. Um, work that we're doing here and um, and establishing that accountability base of accountability. Um, I'm coming to you from the traditional and unceded homelands of the Ahashiman Nation and what's currently called Southern California, Orange County. And uh, where I teach at Cal State San Marcos is just down the road a little ways in San Diego County. So um, I, without further delay. Let me go ahead and uh, and I also wanted to say just the way that that amazing uh, foundation that that Sherry and Darren have both um, created the framework for us to have this conversation and we could have stopped right there with what you both said, um, because you said it so well, but uh, where what I'm going to do is take a deep dive into the the kinds of uh, concepts and ideas and histories that were laid out here just a few minutes ago. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Uh, oops, you don't need to see my Facebook page there. Okay, there. And uh, let's do that and do this. And uh, yeah, so I wanted, we'll talk to you today about um, the convergence of indigenous and Western knowledge, Western science, uh, and the historical context, and some of the dominant narratives and structural issues that still frame our existence as uh, indigenous people. Um, just to give you a little background of uh, where I'm coming from and some of the work that I've been doing, especially recently, um, I'm a member of the Native American Journalists Association. I have a background in journalism. I'm a member of the Society of Environmental Journalists. And uh, just to, to give you an idea of uh, how frequently I actually talk to science community uh, communities of various sorts, just in the last um, six months, I've addressed the National Science Writers Association, um, also the California Lawyers Association. I know that that's not science, but um, I've been talking more and more to the legal communities, various legal communities, uh, including the Washington State Appellate Court judges, which was a couple of weeks ago, um, the Wilderness Society, um, University of Massachusetts Boston Climate Justice Deep Dive was a program at UMB uh, a few uh, that's ongoing. Uh, the universe, also at UMB, um, I spoke to a group of physician science uh, scientists forum on racism and just injustice. So, um, so these conversations are really e emerging, and and it really highlights what uh, what Darren was saying just a minute ago about uh, the 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 growing interest from science communities to hear from native native people about indigenous and traditional knowledge. Um, I, I really have been so pretty blown away in the last year or so uh, at how much I'm seeing that through the invitations to speak that I get and some of the work that I hear from some of my colleagues. So 
Um, and then here are the, the books that were referenced that um, I've written and co-authored. I'm also working on a third book that will be sort of a, a jumps off from as long as grass grows, looking at uh, deeper issues of race and settler colonialism. So, uh, so we need to go really deep into the history. Uh, I'm going to take you to some dark, really pretty dark spaces of um, how we get to where we're at in the, in the current historical moment um, around this, as Sherry said, the uh, you know, violent culture or the violence of dominant culture um, that still structures our, our social systems and legal systems today. Um, and it begins in 15th century century, um, at least in 15th century, some scholarship takes it back to the to the Crusades. We're talking about um, the, the dominance of the Catholic Church, uh, and especially around these doctrines or these, these documents called the papal bulls. These are um, the papal edicts. They're, uh, they're issued from the Pope. There's numerous of them. Um, we see one of the first ones in 1455 called Romanus Pontifex. And, and what it is, is that these bulls were uh, decisions from the Catholic Church that basically granted rights uh, to, to European empires to colonize lands that they haven't even been to yet. So the, this 1455 Romanus Ponte, Pontifex um, grants exclusive rights to Portugal to colonize the Canary Islands and then parts of Africa and to enslave those who resist and to justify the taking of their lands. So think about 1455, this is decades before uh, the Columbus journeys. Um, and then in 1893, Three, you know, the year after Columbus's, you know, so-called discovery, we see other three other papal bulls granted, um, which gives Spain. It get, actually gives Spain all the lands yet to be discovered. So all the, you know, the lands that uh, in the so-called New World, the the Americas, is North and South America, the the Pope you know, go so far as to say this, uh, the Spain owns all of this now. So this is about the powers, dividing the powers between Spain and Portugal, who, you know, at the time were the uh, pervading uh, European em imperial empirical powers, um, all under, of course, the power of the church. Um, and so these, these, these papal bulls gave that power, this justification to the church and to Spain um, based on the fact that indigenous peoples, the people, the inhabitants of these new lands were not Christians. Um, so this is, uh, you know, this is a really important point. This is what I'm writing about in my new book about making these distinctions. This is really not about race at this point. This is about religion, um, that indigenous peoples, the savages and barbarians, are uncivilized and bar barbarous by virtue of the fact ultimately they're not Christians. Um, so all of this uh, gets embedded into the, to the what's today our legal system. Uh, and so we see this uh, in the system of federal Indian law in the US. Uh, and it begins in, in 1823 with what we call the Marshall Trilogy of, of the U.S. Supreme Court, when the U.S. Supreme Court is tasked with um, uh, deciding important decisions, especially around land titles and the legitimacy of European land titles on Indian lands. And in, in 1823, this doctrine of discovery, so what I just explained to you about the papal bulls is the foundation. It establishes this so-called doctrine of discovery that where Europeans imagine themselves superior based on uh, culture, culture and religion, um, and then uh, use that to justify the violent taking of native lands. This gets, this gets uh, encoded into federal law. Um, and today remains that that basis of the legal structure that uh, sub, you know, uh, subjects native people to the authority of the federal government, and I would argue the illegitimate authority of the federal of the United States. Um, other doctrines get uh, 
get articulated in 1831 and 1832 that see native people as domestic dependent nations or wards of the state, um, which creates this thing called the trust doctrine where the United States imagines itself as trustees over Indian property. Um, what that means is that uh, native people don't actually own title to their own lands because we're still seen as um, you know incapable of that. So the federal government is is the trustee of those properties and that maintains that scaffolding of authority and um, dominance over our lands. Uh, other there are other problematic legal doctrines that maintain like the plenary power doctrine where the co Congress has, sees itself as having ultimate authority over Indian lands and lives. This is a not something in the past, this is present, this structures our, our lives as Indian people. Um, and a note here is that the doctrine of discovery is not just in the US, so it doesn't just impa impact American Indians in the US, but it's the basis of numerous other settler states as well, um, like New Zealand and Australia and Canada and others who have uh, actually uh, quoted the uh, Johnson decision from 1823 to maintain their own structures of domination over indigenous peoples in their countries. And so, um, so all of that, you know, we're, we're all familiar with this history that we call manifest destiny. Um, and so manifest destiny is, is a, uh, it really coagulates into this new language that we have that we say it's a framework that is pretty much the basis of American Indian studies and the way we teach, um, the way we teach our histories and our structures today. Um, uh, you know, we've finally lifted it out of post-colonial studies um, because settler, as settler colonialism teaches us there is no post in settler colonialism because settler colonialism um, co uh, coalesces into this structure of, of, uh, of you know, unconsenting domination. Um, and this uh, Patrick Wolf um, is really associated with, you know, initially coining this phrase settler colonialism that has taken such root in our, in our uh, own pedagogies and epistemologies. And, um, and he said that settler colonialism eliminates the native population to replace. So it's not just a historic event. It's not something that happens in the past. It's something that, that becomes um, this structure. So it's ongoing. And the goal of it is always to get native lands with the, with um, the view to replace native populations. So it does this in, in all kinds of different ways. Um, through the le legal scaffolding of the state, of the settler state. Um, and so in, in this scaffolding, in this legal structure and these uh, dominant net narratives, indigenous peoples are constructed as inferior, just like they were in the papal bulls, which legitimize that taking of land and subjugation through, again, through religion, um, not initially through race. Um, and then, so native peoples, as savages, as uncivilized savages, becomes this organizing trope, this organizing principle in the American state, in the US state. And it's even in the, the for those of you who might not know this, it's even in the Declaration of Independence. We are, you know, this document that celebrates, you know, revolution and freedom and liberty and all that, um, you know, also cements indigenous peoples as savage, as merciless Indian savages. Um, so this is, this is how deep this goes. Um, and so that trope of savagery of uncivilized, uh, you know, barbarians um, shapes all these state structures um, and the social landscapes. Uh, and they're embedded in every aspect of American society. You have been indoctrinated to it, just like I have. It's, we are all socialized to these narratives. Um, this is, this is uh, the book that I wrote with Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz. This is what it was about, um, break, deconstructing how all of this is so deeply embedded in the American uh, social system, social landscape. Um, and so its logics become common knowledge. So, you know, the fact that native people were backwards and uncivilized and needed Christianity, they, Christianity, they needed improvement, um, to, which justified the taking of the lands and uh, the, you know, all kinds of 
other horribly abusive policies, um, just be is just becomes common knowledge. Everybody knows these things to be true, um, regardless of their actual veracity. And so, um, you know, not surprisingly, most of us are, are aware, aware to some extent or another uh, about how these uh, these emerge into um, these ideas of race. Uh, and, and so theories about race, the way scholars are uh, right about it, um, goes back to you know, the era of 15th century Spanish incursions into the new world. So while they are using Christianity to justify the taking of these lands um, and, and the enslavement of indigenous and black bodies, um, they, it's already, it's already embedded in the Spanish social, social system um, with the um, expulsion of Jews from the state. So it really begins like the racializing of people, of the, the othering, the, dif the differing of different, of other kinds of people that don't meet certain kinds of social standards uh, begins with Jews in, in Spain. That's how uh, numerous scholars write about this. Um, and and then it's also you know has this this growing articulation uh, in in the United States, um, especially in the you know seventeenth century, um, with um, with what we call this term scientific racism and, and social Darwinism, um, and and it, then it coagulates into the fields of anthropology, and there is an entire body of literature um, that that takes that logic of indigenous inferiority uh, and and sees human civilizations in terms of hierarchies um, and Europeans. Uh, you know, white Europeans are always at the top of this hierarchy of human civilizations and um, that those of uh, not fair skin uh, are and, and not European, uh, um, you know, skin type and, and appearance uh, are somewhere below that in, in a descending order. And some are seen as being more, uh, more civilizable than others. And some of the, the techniques that they use are craniometry. And the, the photo that you see here is, uh, you know, some of this craniometry in practice where they're measuring skulls and they're measuring a bone structure and all this to determine, you know, where civilizations fit on this hierarchy of, um, or where people fit on this hierarchy of civilization, um, which of course is the beginning of eugenics movements that we see um, today. I mean, the eugenics movement hasn't died, it's just changed shape. Um, and, uh, and so all of these logics of race, this, you know, now we understand, you know, social scientists and human, uh, humanities disciplines will say, you know, race, we know, we know that there really is no biological difference between humans other than surface appearance. Um, but, um, uh, so, and since there's no, so this biological determinism is really, it's really false, it's not real, but race is still, a, you know, a social construction, and that social construction of race is what still, um, you know, dogs us today, and, you know, there's all kinds of literature about the racial formation of states, and, uh, you know, and how that continues to impede um, certain pop and, and, and be obstacles to justice for particular populations. Um, in the meantime, there are thousands of indigenous remains and artifacts, the way science has, uh, you know, uh, justified the taking of human re remains, the digging up of uh, indigenous graves, um, the hauling off of indigenous bodies off of battle sites uh, during the Indian Wars period, I mean, in order to justify scientific study. Uh, so there's, there's all these different ways that indigenous bodies and remains of indigenous people uh, still uh, are in collections of universities and museums, um, even despite the fact that we have uh, in 1991, a, 
a law that gets passed called the NAGPRA, um, Native American Graves uh, and Repatriation Protection Act, uh, which was intended to return uh, under certain circumstances, some of these remains and artifacts to their uh, tribal communities, despite, you know, 30 years of this law, there is still, you know, thousands of uh, remains in these collections. Um, and one of the foundational concepts that we're still, or questions that are still uh, trying to be answered by Native scholars and others is, are Native people, uh, uh, are Indians a race or a political group? Um, that's way too big of a concept um, to get into right now, but it's a fundamental question that's actually being taken up in, uh, in high courts um, uh, right this very minute and is likely headed to the Supreme Court. Okay. So the, on, this, the, the ongoing legacy, I wanna talk about the ongoing legacy of some of the scientific uh, racism uh, and uh, these oppressive practices um, by science over over the centuries, is this? I it, it's you know not just about how genocide. So these these are all genocidal processes that that uh, the U.S. is founded on settler colonialism. Um, as that framework is ultimately a genocidal process. It's physically genocidal and culturally genocidal. And part of that, the genocide, the cultural genocide of that is a term that we're hearing more and more that we say that we call epistemicide, um, which just refers to the killing of knowledge systems. So this, this you know, very, these part of the violence of these processes um, is the, the ways that Native people have been forced into the dominance of American culture through these, through policy, uh, you know, through the legal structure, you know, enabled by the legal structure and created in policy. Um, so becoming structural, um, you know, we can look especially to the 19th century with the policies of forced assimilation uh, into boarding schools, uh, and uh, in, in another type of uh, cultural genocide or a, a mechanism of cultural genocide, which is called linguicide. So part of the killing of knowledge systems is the killing of languages, uh, which was done uh, systematically through um, the forcing of native people to become uh, less native through these boarding schools uh, and to become white. So that, that was literally uh, the, the motto in the boarding school system. They, the, you know, Colonel Pratt said, killing the Indian to save the man. And so, you know, this is code for, uh, you know, killing Indians to turn them into white people because in that those uh, social Darwinist structures, native people were seen to be uh, to be improvable um, through these these kinds of um, policies of you know getting rid of their cultures. Um, and so we see it structurally in university systems, the way university systems privilege certain kinds of knowledges over others uh, and certain types of the way that we use language, the way that we use words, um, even concepts like this idea of objectivity, um, which is highly problematic. It, uh, you know, this idea of objectivity seems so benign, seems so um, uh, not a problem, but ultimately there's, you know, there's ways that we can unpack that to, ex to um, reveal and expose uh, processes of an implicit cultural bias um, that is always, you know, leans toward, uh, you know, this religious or uh, this uh, European Eurocentric uh, superiority and away from indigenous knowledge. And, um, and so it's reinforced these through terms that are highly contested, like the term science. This is another term that uh, Native people, Native scholars are, are working hard to problematize. Uh, you know, Western science sees itself as having uh, superior knowledge uh, and superior types of in, engaging knowledge and, and pedagogies and methodologies. Um, and whereas native, as native scholars are more and more writing about saying that, you know, we have always had our own scientific systems, systems that were based on, you know, in deep observation through long periods of time and, you know, having tried certain things and failed and having had, had to learn, especially around land management regimes, things like that. Um, so, so it raises these questions like what is, 
considered valuable, legitimate knowledge. This is this is where we're at right now. This is the the that fork in the road of the conversation that we're having right now. And the speaker series is that we are attempting to to change that paradigm uh, and recognize that there are numerous valid and legitimate knowledge systems and they all need each other. And so um, finally, uh, I, you know, to talk about climate change, how does uh, climate change, you know, fit into this conversation and, and the history of climate change and policy around climate change? How does that involve indigenous peoples? Um, and kind of briefly, we can look at, uh, you know, we know that there's all this, um, you know, data and studies that confirm that indigenous peoples globally are disproportionately impacted um, by climate change. Um, and, and so this is, a, you know, this is, we, we know this. Um, but they've been systematically excluded from policy discussions beginning with, with um, the Kyoto Protocol, which of course is the only real in, uh, international uh, mechanism that we've had to address climate change and, and it failed. Um, but we're still, uh, we're still involved in processes uh, of the Paris Accords, which are born out of the Kyoto Protocol. Um, but both, uh, one of the problems with them for indigenous peoples is that they, they, they anchor the marketization of solutions, um, which inevitably favors states and state governments. Um, and in that process, uh, silences silences indigenous peoples um, because in, you know the, the the foundation these structures of um, of authority and um, dominance over native peoples are not are not addressed at all. It's left to states to deal with that. Where but the problem, of course, is that states are the problem in these in these legal structure these legal regimes and structures. Um, Another example is that in the world of conservation, the conservation world is highly problematic for indigenous peoples because it relies on these Eurocentric views of wilderness as unpeopled landscapes. So um, uh, what this means for indigenous peoples in the US and other places is the ongoing dispossession. And it's arguably worse uh, in some places more than others where uh, you know, national parks, um, uh, you know, still, still systematically uh, keep indigenous peoples um, separated from their, their traditional ways of living, which is really interesting when you consider that indigenous peoples control 80% of the world's uh, biodiversity uh, and yet remain 5% of the world's population. So um, it's really, you know, becoming more and more apparent that indigenous peoples and their cultural diversity is, is in intimately, um, inextricably tied to biodiversity, which is another reason I think we're having this conversation now. Um, and then climate change and its impacts are the result of colonization, the, um, the way that indigenous scholars write about it, especially Kyle White, um, who calls uh, climate change intensified colonialism. And I think he's right on, on target there. Um, and it, it recognizes that native people, you know, we, we did not create the system. You know, climate change is the result of these uh, empirical uh, processes of 500 years that we did not create. So, you know, that we need to problematize that the whole concept of the Anthropocene. That's one of the things that he's saying, and I imagine he'll talk to you about that when you hear from him. Um, but the, the imposition of state structures and the suppression of indigenous land management are part of this. Uh, the, the exacerbation of climate change. So especially around wildfires, we'll hear uh, in the news about how all these out of control wildfires here in the West are because of uh, climate change. But it's really, that's only part of the picture. Um, climate change, you know, the, the exposure, these new you know, dramatic wildfires are, they really begin with the mismanagement of forests because of the, the colonization of those lands and the deliberate, um, you know, ending of indigenous 
uh, management of those lands uh, through things like controlled burning, cultural burning that had been done um, for time immemorial. And so, so the you know separating indigenous peoples from their land management practices really has uh, has deep um, roots in in these climate change impacts. And then finally, um, green energy. Um, you know, to talk about green energy and how um, you know you know we think about wanting to mitigate climate change through uh, you know abandoning fossil fuel resources and you know limiting greenhouse gases. And so we do this through green energy, through alternative impacts or alternative um, energy sources like, uh, like, you know, the like batteries, like hybrid cars and electric cars, which all rely on this battery technology. Um, I, this picture on the, uh, that you see here is a, the site of a future, uh, uh, lithium mine on the Fort McDermott Reservation in Nevada. Um, this is coming down the pike. This is going to be a new source of struggle for indigenous peoples as their lands are targeted for toxic extraction. Um, there is nothing uh, green about lithium extraction, uh, as probably uh, most of you know. Um, so, you know, these are, you know, we can see, we can even talk about those of you who maybe are uh, present to um, news, international news, uh, Bolivia, the government, the democratically elected government of Bolivia was overthrown with U.S. support a couple of years ago because of uranium mining and um, the nationalizing of that resource. So these are going to be uh, ongoing issues. And uh, I've got three more slides. I just want to share with you some suggested readings I have. Uh, on, based on ideas uh, and topics on scientific racism, on the foundations of federal Indian law, the doctrine of discovery in the Catholic Church. You'll see some good resources there. Uh, on the ideas of epistemicide uh, and on contested knowledges and the, inter whoops, the integration, oh shoot, the integration of um, inner, in, indigenous knowledge and Western science there. And then um, finally, uh, more on climate change uh, and how to think about in, how to work with indigenous peoples moving forward. So that's the end of my slide presentation. I think that we can open it to, um, to discussion. Thank you so much, Dina. Um, it's just so helpful to have that additional context and for all of your work. And Sherry and Darren, if you wanna um, join us again here. Um, and we have had several questions about um, whether or not we're going to share the resources, and we definitely will um, will send something out afterwards with a whole list of, of everything that we've talked about here. But maybe before we um, before we go into questions, um, Sherry and Darren, is there anything else that you'd like to add um, as well, given you know what Dina has just shared? Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Dina. Uh, that was incredibly informative for many people, I'm sure, uh, as an Indigenous attorney and somebody who spends my time dealing with many of these issues on a daily basis. Uh, I certainly, um, you know, understand the present day implications of what you presented, not as something that is, is historical, but something that is uh, in the present day. Uh, I just, I have, I teach a class for, um, the University of Maine. And one of the things that we're talking about right now is the doctrine of discovery. And we were just talking about the 2005 um, City of Sherrill versus United Nation case where Justice Ginsburg cites uh, um, the Marshall Trilogy in, in the opinion there, in that decision. And so this is not you know, a thing that's relegated to the past where they broke the constitution with their very first act in deciding a case uh, related to indigenous peoples, you know, establishment clause, art, uh, you know, Article One. <laughs> and so, uh, when we're looking at um, this this history, both in the law and within science, um, the the incredible harm that has been done as a result of breaking the rules of the discipline are profound. And so when we think about breaking the rules of the discipline, whether it be scientific or legal, 
um, and think about the the implications of that. I I really um, I really love that term epistemicide uh, because it covers over all other ways of knowing. Um, and before I forget again, I just want to say that I am the executive director of the Land Peace Foundation and that the Land Peace Foundation is honored to be co-hosting this series. I forgot to mention that at the beginning. Um, uh, but one of the things that I think, you know, as we think about these implications and we think about where we are right now, uh, one of the things that I, I'm very interested in at the present moment and something that I've personally been working on in my, in my own professional um, career is dealing with impacts of climate change on the ground, adaptation and mitigation, and representing or working with the populations of indigenous people, others impacted by climate change, who are being approached with adaptation and mitigation strategies that oftentimes move them away from uh, ways of being that are in relationship and harmonious with our environments and ecosystems um, and move them toward the very behaviors and activities that are causing the harm. And so the disconnect in the mind uh, in that regard is something that I think that indigenous peoples can really help bridge the gap on. Um, where do you feel that indigenous knowledge, traditional indigenous knowledge and traditional ecological knowledge, which is, as we know, millennia worth of data, um, where can that knowledge best be applied to meet the crises of our day, in your opinion? Uh, well, something that I keep saying in, in various rooms like this that I'm in, in, in my own writing and I'm thinking about this is that the way that we imagine, you know, mitigating climate change and or adapting to climate change, you know, certainly is always is always framed in economic terms. Like that, that's one of the problems. I think that's what what you're referring to about, uh, you know, imagining, you know, trying to get indigenous people to fit into these kind of boxes that that don't really work. Um, things like the Green New Deal. Okay, the Green New Deal, um, the way it was in initially imagined, you know, it and the way it probably still is being imagined is really in these reduct reductionist uh, economic terms, um, without challenging or questioning um, the logics of that. And so, for Indigenous peoples, this is really dangerous. So, uh, one of the things that you know, one of some of my work has been to you know say that. To say, there, to say that here's ways that the Green New Deal is really, is still perpetuates harms to indigenous communities. Um, here's ways that we need to indigenize it. Um, and so, so we think about imagining solutions through these marketized, just like the Kyoto Protocol did, marketizing solutions to maintain state economies, a world economy. Um, and then also uh, techno fixes, like how we, you know, we imagine uh, sustainability through techno fixes, through, you know, better technology. Let's get rid of bad technology through better technology, um, you know, which as I showed in that slide around lithium mining, you know, presents, we're, we still don't have, we're still avoiding certain kinds of problems. So ultimately, this is really, a, you know, I, my argument is that it's, it's ultimately a pro, an issue of philosophy. It's, it's, a, it's an, a problem of worldview, epistemology, and philosophy, and the values that underpin how we make decisions as societies. Um, and, you know, from an indigenous perspective, we know that our knowledge systems, our knowledge bases are, come from an entirely different orientation to the world. Um, it's an, an orientation based on understanding ourselves as part of the natural world, the not the center of it, but as part of the natural world in relationship to the, to, um, the various worlds that we inhabit. And so when, when we understand those very different paradigms, um, we can ask different questions, like in our research projects. Um, when, and I mean scientists, it, you know, like if you can expand your lens, expand your perspective about uh, whatever it is that you're working on, what are the initial questions that you're asking? So how can you, how can you uh, complicate those questions by understanding 
through a different philosophical lens, like through the, the ideas of relationality and reciprocity. What does it mean to, uh, to conduct research, to imagine solutions to problems? If you imagine human populations as having um, reciprocity with the natural world and thus responsibility to it. Mm. You know, so, I have I have two terms, Dina, that I like to use in regard to to this kind of thing. And uh, you know, I like to use the the phrase uh, green colonization. Uh, that this green movement's a new form of colonization, but also scientific blasphemy, right? Because for a lot of people, science is their god. And you know, talk about using the name of your god in vain, right? When you're using science as a means to promote and perpetuate the very same thing that has caused the problem. Uh, you know, how many, how many philosophers do we have that have told us uh, that you can't use the same methodology to solve a problem as the one that caused it? You can't use the same tools to, uh, you know, to dismantle the master's house. You know, all of these, all of these things that we've been told time and time again um, throughout time, and yet science is now coming forward and using uh, science to try to address the problems that some of this has caused in the first place. And so this is why it's critical for new ways of thinking to enter into the equation. So There's, yeah. I'm seeing two questions that might actually refer to that. So maybe I'll just put those out to you, to you and you can see if you want to weave that into it related to what you're saying. So there was one question about um, asking whether you could say more about what it means um, for a solution to be marketized. Um, and if you could give like more specific examples. So I think you were starting to, to do that. And that person was also wondering about the concept of control of biodiversity and the statistic that 80% is controlled by indigenous peoples. Um, what do control and biodiversity mean in this context and how is that control manifest? Um, and then the other piece was about how uh, has the abuse of science through ex um, extractive in industries led to ongoing impacts in tribal communities? Okay, there's three questions in there, I think. Um, the first one was, uh, okay, say that again. So the first piece was about um, saying more and having specific examples about what, what you're talking about with oh, market Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. um, so going back to the example of the Kyoto Protocol and the Paris Accords, um, the, the Kyoto Protocol, what it did at, at its core, what it did was it created a cap and trade system. So when you talk about, when you hear that term cap and trade of greenhouse gas emissions, that's what that was. It placed value on uh, g greenhouse gas emissions that could then be traded on the open market. Um, and so polluters could, uh, could sell, who needed more, uh, more credits to be able to continue to pollute could buy the credits from less polluting countries and continue to, to spew greenhouse gas emissions. In, and so it's this big, it's almost like a shell game, but what, what it did was it, so that's what we mean. We say it marketizes, it just, it centers markets and economies um, to imagine, to create incentives, to want to, uh, you know, lower greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and- the Dina, can you also talk about the recent commodification of our water? Um, are you talking about something well, mar water has always been commodified, I think. Well, it's recently become a trade commodity in the open market. Oh, the, I'm not, I don't know about that. So maybe you could talk about that. So, I mean, I certainly know, you know, there's a whole history of, you know, in, in the legal system, certainly in the U.S., around how, uh, you know, beginning in the turn of the 20th century, these were issues that the, the, the U.S., saw coming you know down down the road is being really important about you know who's going to have rights to water so uh, that's a really big conversation but um but certainly the you know we can look at this this trend to privatize water uh you know really became um, obvious in the 1990s with the Cochabamba situation in Bolivia. So, you know, going back to Bolivia, a long history of fighting the privatization of uh, natural resources. 
And um, that was, I don't know, for those of you who are old enough to remember that history, but um, it was a, a, a very high profile fight um, that came out of some of the, again, marketized solutions where there used to be in the World Bank and the, uh, the International Monetary Fund, these, uh, this program called um, structural adjustment programs. And what it was, was, um, was these global market institutions um, taking countries that, you know, very um, low, so-called low development countries um, to, to open up their private resources to help pay for their debts, like the debts for development. Um, and that always impacted indigenous populations the most. And so the Cochabamba battle was about um, fighting a structural adjustment program, which would have um, made water basically unaffordable unaffordable for a lot of people. And so um, my, my knowledge about the history sort of begins with that. And I think that uh, what you're talking about, Sherry, is just an extension of that or the, the uh, showing how th that hasn't gone away, this impulse to, to um, commodify uh, natural resources that humans need to live on. Yeah, I was just specifically talking about in December, they started trading water futures on Wall Street um, because of an expectation of scarcity. Well, uh, not surprising. Yeah, it's just, it's devastating. Uh, yeah. Darren? Yeah, and I actually wanna uh, pick up on one of the, uh, the next points that, uh, points of question that, that Laura was, was speaking to and um, someone asking about control of biodiversity and we, we you know, that's, um, let me see if I can weave this through, Dina. <laughs> Your lecture is so dense, uh, you know, and I know you know this, that what you went through was, you know, at least four or five weeks of, a, of a class. Um, but I, I'll, I'll try to uh, get to this issue of control of biodiversity. And, um, you know, there's a great effort right now happening around indigenous activism in response to, uh, you know, the the Biden administration having this goal of thirty percent of public lands protected, public you know lands protected by conservation by twenty thirty, um, there had been you know the attempt to protect fifty percent by twenty fifty, and other groups and other environmental activist groups, um, and the UN um, Biodiversity Conference. Um, was supposed to meet last fall, was supposed to then meet, um, I believe, uh, last week or two weeks ago, or, or in a couple of weeks, is now again postponed until October. Um, there's a real set of actions taking place um, around that, that this not, you know, and I know that these concepts have um, uh, a lot of pushback from the marketeers and the globalists or whatever, however you want to uh, talk about that. Um, sorry about that. Um, and I think the, uh, you know, the one thing that in indigenous activist circles, and I'm just going to bring this back, um, is to really think about that this not be um, the kind of things that happened with Kyoto, with R Red Plus, um, with, you know, that, that it, you know, what is biodiversity, I think, you know, is one of these questions and sort of why are indigenous people sort of incidentally, you know, living on, right? <laughs> Maybe not in full control of, but living in the world's centers of, 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 of biodiversity. Uh, and then what is the future of that given other environmental climate crises in terms of what we have seen in the last 500 years around scarcity of resources and uh, development and these legacies both in science and, and, and environmental policy. So I, maybe you could speak to that. I know in your book, you, you take us through that in really interesting ways as well, but where do you, where do you see that going, uh, Dina? Well, I mean, I think we're seeing it in places like Brazil right now where um, you have the, the Brazilian equivalent of Donald Trump in charge with Bolsonaro and um, a renewed uh, renewed campaigns that are genocidal ultimately for indigenous peoples in places like the Amazon. So there's this renewed um, 
you know, these renewed efforts to dispossess indigenous peoples of those lands for further development, which inevitably involves burning down rainforest and cultivating, you know, doing, um, what do you call that cow, you know, what do you call that, um, you know, ranching, you know, develop, you know, all, you know, converting the land to make it productive for, for markets. Um, so, you know, and different, different versions of that are happening in different countries and different continents um, that expose indigenous peoples to these, again, these genocidal processes. Um, and oftentimes it's done in the name of conservation. Um, so, you know, with states wanting to conserve or preserve wildland spaces, um, they, you know, it comes this idea that, that, that wilderness is pink free of people, right? And so that means that people have to be run off. Like this is a, this is a template that the, U, the U.S. created in the mid, in the, in the 19th century um, with the formation of the first uh, national parks, especially you know, sent the first three, Yosemite, Glacier, and, uh, and Yellowstone, um, Yellowstone being the first of those. Um, so this idea of unpeopled wilderness um, you know, gets created by the U.S. and has spread throughout the rest of the world, and the logics of that um, continue to um, expose indigenous peoples to that harm. Um, Mark Dowie has written um, really clearly about this uh, in his book, Conservation Refugees, for example. Um, I'm working on a project um, right now with a colleague that will, um, that is aiming to, to create um, a model for co-management agreements with indigenous peoples in various places, not just the US, um, but in, in various countries where these, these um, these risks exist for, for indigenous people, um, where if we can get this thing off the ground, create a model that, that um, we can, you know, embed or um, a partner, find, find um, uh, interest if for states to, to enact, then this will help, you know, in, in theory, protect indigenous peoples. Because when you think about that biodiversity question, indigenous peoples, um, controlling 80% of the biodiversity, though we're talking about undeveloped lands. I think ultimately at its, at its root, that's what we mean when we say biodiversity, these biodiverse regions that are still, um, still uh, uh, relatively undeveloped, um, which is really important like for native people. Native people live in harmony with those ecosystems. Um, that's the definition of sustainability. That's like, you know, there's a whole conversation there too about what we mean around sustainability, but for indigenous peoples, it's this long-term land tenure uh, that um, where they know how to, they live in reciprocity with these environments in ways that ensure the health of the land um, so that humans can endure. Um, so, um, oh my gosh, I just lost my train of thought on that, but maybe I should just- Maybe we can add another question in here, which is, um... You know, somebody was asking about how we begin to challenge the structures that you were referring to in your talk and, and how native nations then could be recognized um, as completely equal sovereign nations. So what, what can we do and um, how do we begin to uproot the concepts? Um, how can we, especially as non-native people, um, get involved? Yeah, you know, like that's one of the million dollar questions. And um, that's why this conversation about law uh, and the legal structure is so critical and so key um, to answering that question because it is the legal system that keeps us locked into that uh, into that um, structure. And and what do we do about that? How do we repudiate the doctrine of discovery so that it is not the foundation of federal Indian law that keeps us locked into this uh, you know relationship of of um, hegemony and and unconsenting authority. Um, so like, you know, if you're going to really deconstruct all of that, it mean you know, logically, it means uh, repudiating the doctrine of discovery, transforming the trust doctrine, um, you know, dealing with the plenary power doctrine. So these are, you know, legal, you know, until we deal, my argument is that until that's actually dealt with, there's, 
the, the, the solutions are going to be really limited and, and still maintain that, re, that, that unconsenting relationship. Um, in my mind, that's, that's how it is. Now, other people may disagree with that. But um, in the meantime, I think that there, you know, we Native people have become adept at uh, using all kinds of tools to resist uh, the, the settler state, to resist the control of the settler state. Um, one of the tools that we have right now, which is interesting, is that we have a Native woman that has been uh, appointed the, the um, Department of Interior Secretary. So this has never happened before. We have, we have had uh, Indigenous leaders in high levels of government uh, going back to, this, to the 19th century. This is not new. Um, but what's still, you know, it remains to be seen. We've never had somebody uh, in charge of the Department of Interior. So, uh, you know, again, it remains to be seen what actually can come of that in terms of uh, good outcomes. Um, I, I'm, I'm skeptical. I, I'm cautiously optimistic and simultaneously skeptical because, uh, you know, the structure is still the structure and it's still built on the logics of eliminate indigenous elimination um, and assimilation. So, uh, yeah. You know, Dina, I, I really want to bring back uh, this whole concept full circle because it really does go back to the very beginning. And so when, you know, when you're talking about unpeopled forests, I mean, that's the same idea of terra nullius, right? That goes back to the doctrine of discovery where um, the, the belief is that if it's not white Christian people who are populating or discovering, uh, then everyone else, all beings that exist within that place um, are, are ignored. They're made invisible. Um, and so this really is a deep-seated mindset that's connected to the ideology that's connected to the Christian law of nations that was integrated into the US legal system in violation of the constitution under Macintosh. And so what you're saying is really important for people to recognize that there really needs to be a repudiation of the doctrines of discovery. Um, you know, all of the framework that this sits upon legally uh, is founded in religious law that was integrated into US law in violation of the constitution. And yeah, so it's it's for a separation of church and state in right. the US, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So I just wanted to point out the importance of that and how it all does really loop right back to the very beginning. Right. And, and and Laura, Laura sorry, ahead. if I could just interject just to um, just close one of the loops. There's so many open um, around the, the biodiversity and, and, and Dina's uh, response to that. Um, and I think our, our very, you know, the concern is that you know, given these legal positional superiorities, right? And the positional superiority is a language that Linda Smith and others mobilize around the, the intersections of these legal uh, jurisdictional issues. And then also the scientific issues. Like if you are neither legitimate as a state actor in this system or as an actor of, you know, active management and scientific practice, you are delegitimized on these two fronts. The, the fact that where indigenous people live has the most biodiversity is not because we're not managing it, the lands, right? You talked about harmony, Dina. I just wanna make this very, very clear. It is active management that maintains the biodiversity through indigenous knowledge systems. And so the idea that um, many in the conservation movement see, and continuing this legacy of creation of national parks, see indigenous people um, in the way of realizing their goals of protecting lands and don't see the fact that us living and managing and actively engaging the lands is part of what is producing and maintaining the biodiversity is part of the real, is part of the other side of that, right? Of of the positional superiority maintained in very maybe nuanced ways, you know. I, I never gotten the conservationist say to say that, you know, you know these people are just so backward they don't really know how to manage their lands, but they do it in ways of sort of building upon scientific practice, where we're actually knowing more and more that lands that indigenous people inhabit, um, if they have some level of control, actually outpace. Um, 
the, the biodiversity of the lands actively managed by conservation groups. So just these findings of the, the um, importance of indigenous knowledge systems of management and engagement um, is, is still interconnected. I think the, you know, this is the theme that we wanted out of today too, is that the positional superiority is imagined by the Pope in 15th century continue through all these networks of other positional superiorities maintained in institutions like you know the one I work in and other places that I try to um, I try to work against and work with in all the many ways that 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 we've talked about but I just and I think you do in your uh, as the grass as long as the grass grows book you do such a good way of telling that story of relations between Native people, environmentalists, environmental scientists, you know, just that sort of back and forth struggle that we've had, you know, in terms of, um, you know, you know, maybe they're learning, maybe there's more hope, but I, you know, it's just a very difficult process to be delegitimized in the legal structures as Indigenous people and then facing the same institutional resistance uh, in, the, in the scientific and, and management spaces. Yeah, I mean, it's just important. That's why it's, you know, we talk about this being structural and being embedded in every aspect of our social systems. Like it's not just legal, it's not just scientific, it's embedded in, in the conditioning. We are all conditioned to it. We are all miseducated to use uh, Cornell Powerty's, you know, word. Um, we're miseducated to, to, um, to think that indigenous peoples are inferior and, and have nothing of value to contribute to the world. And I wanna pick up on, you know, as a final question, uh, Dina, I wanna pick up on this theme of diversity um, and, and just point out, because I think this is an important distinction that there is no pan-Indian ideology. There is no pan-Indian cultural way of being. Um, and, and just have you talk a little bit about the importance of understanding um, the uniqueness of each tribal nation, uh, cultures, uh, ways of knowing, ways of being, and to, uh, to uh, really dispel mythology that, that, oh, this is how the Indians think um, as a way to just leave us open for the expansion of the conversation as we go forward. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, because it's really, it's really easy to fall into that idea about the, you know, the Indians being a monolithic uh, group of people uh, that all think the same way, that all uh, lived the same way. Um, and and the, the thing about that is that it's, I think it's, okay, so first we have to say that uh, that is not true. But that said, there are still, there are concepts and I, their commonalities, their common threads throughout indigenous societies, like for example, here on Turtle Island in the US um, and North America, um, there are common threads that we can say, you know, it, these are, there's qualities about indigenous uh, life ways and knowledge that uh, are, you know, where they lived in this, uh, this ethic of relation, relation and kinship um, to the natural world. Um, uh, the ethic of reciprocity and respect and responsibility. These are common, common indigenous values that come from an, a spatial, we say a spatial orientation to the world. This is something that, uh, you know, some of our uh, most important indigenous thinkers like Vine Deloria Jr. Uh, taught us, you know, early on, you know, when he made the distinction between uh, Eurocentric white settler society uh, and indigenous and, you know, American Indian people was that, um, that, that part of that difference in paradigm and why they're so illegible to each other um, is, is that one is temporally oriented, like Western science, Western, uh, Western uh, philosophical uh, worldviews, Eurocentric uh, ways of being are temporal. They, they are list, they're, uh, uh, cemented in, in uh, uh, orientation to the world based on time, like which, you know, past li linear time, past, present, future. So time is this abstract where for native people, it's, um, it's place oriented, it's spatial. 
It's understanding the human uh, place in the world as emerging from very particular ecosystems. I think that's a really important point, um, places uh, and ecosystems. So who indigenous peoples understand themselves to be and the way that they view, see the world and, and interact with the world is through um, very different kinds of environments. Uh, you know, a worldview based on a, on a uh, relationship to a very arid, dry desert biome is very different than uh, uh, an epistemology based uh, uh, from some a group that lives in the Olympic rainforest peninsula. Um, that's an example. But um, so, so these, these knowledge systems all come as a result of be emerging from different biomes to use that science language. Um, and <clears throat> yeah, so th again, there was another point I was going to make, but it's kind of drifted away. <laughs> yeah, thank you. There's, there's so many great questions. And luckily with this being a series, we were definitely going to get into some of them um, later, but I wanted to just um, go around maybe and have you each give some, some final thoughts or suggestions or things that you want to add to, to wrap up for today. So Darren, maybe we could start with you. I was trying to um, answer as many of the questions in the q &A. Anyway, um, there's a lot of great questions and I really wanna thank Dina for laying out, you know, the, 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 the very vast structures. We will um, be posting, you know, all along we wanted to make sure we posted, you know, resources for everyone. We recognize that everyone's watching this maybe at different times and, and everyone wanted from us when we presented to like further resources. And Dina did a great job accommodating that in her slides and everything that she has in her slides will be available to everyone. Um, I guess what I, you know, in terms of just a wrap up, you know, the, as, as you could tell from both the presentation and all of your questions, while we, ha we are trying to separate the issues around um, the his, these histories of colonial and racist policies and and science the the the, the scientific participation in these horrible policies it is impossible to separate them out and um, Dina mobilized the epistemicide language it's hard to separate them out from the kinds of things that Kyle will talk about in our next session uh, in terms of the challenges of mobilizing and making a value, uh, recognized value of indigenous ways of knowing uh, and science and, and, and management systems. So I think just, you know, the fact that one sought out to <laughs> destroy the other um, and, and uh, oftentimes um, there's so many examples of this. And uh, again, highly recommend Dina's book for her. Obviously it's a great, it's a great entry point. I mean, just talking about things like why did they kill all the buffalo in the upper Midwest? You know, like all these things were about killing not just us as people, but our, yes, as long as crest grows. Um, not only all of us, she, she actually uh, carries me around as her publicist, um, but also just, you know, really um, all those histories are so specific and still structured in our experience today. So I just want to reiterate that. Uh, and also typing out an answer, my, URL for the digital history, the, uh, my link does not equal endorsement. So I'll just say that as a brief, but thanks, thanks Laura and everyone for, for being here today. Cool. Thank you so much, Darren. Sherry, do you wanna go next? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, uh, Darren. And uh, Dina, thank you so much for agreeing to be here with us and to share everything that you've shared. Uh, it's only the tip of the iceberg, and I, I strongly encourage people to continue these conversations and continue these conversations with um, with Dina. You know, um, this is not the only only access that you have to her. She is accessible and available to further this discussion with any of those of you who might wish to continue having this discussion with her. Um, and I also just want to mention, as I as we're going, because we, you know, there are a lot of questions we didn't get a chance to, to get to. Darren and I tried to answer as many of them as we could going through the Q and A. Um, but the last session of this series, we are going to tie it all together, and we're going to get back to many of these questions. And so, I just want to encourage people to stick with us through the series because there are going to be unanswered questions from each section. 
um, each session. And, and at the end, we will try to tie all of those together and to answer as many of those questions as we can. I also just want to mention that one of the distinctions that I think is really important between uh, indigenous ways of knowing and uh, Western scientific ways of knowing and even Western scholarly ways of knowing is the notion of credentialing. And that when we think about the ways that uh, information is credentialed within an indigenous framework uh, and the ways that uh, it's necessary to credential somebody um, through Western scholarly uh, scientific frameworks, uh, there's, a, there's a very big difference. And so uh, where we get our information, our knowledge keepers, our wisdom keepers, are not credentialed within academia. They're not credentialed oftentimes within the institutions. Uh, they are people who are the keepers of historical knowledge and data that has been passed down generation to generation as a lived experience, uh, as a lived experience in relationship to ecosystems. And, and I think that that idea of credentialing causes Western science to miss a great deal of information that's critical to the formulation of appropriate solutions to the problems that are being faced. And so as we, as we move forward, we'll get more into that discussion, but I just, I just wanted to add that as another way of thinking about uh, the ways of accessing knowledge and the ways that knowledge is valued. Uh, within society also needs a real shift uh, as, as we're moving through this process. So thank you all very much for, for being with us today. And again, thank you, Laura, Darren, and Dina for, for being here um, and sharing what you have with, with all of us. Yeah, thank you. And Dina, maybe we'll hear some final thoughts from you. And then I have just a couple of logistics for people. And I'm going to put, I'm going to put a reflections form in the, um, in the chat as well so that you know we want to hear more from you we want to learn about you we want to um you know hear what you're thinking about and and the ideas that you have and stuff so we will put that in the chat as well um yeah thank you i mean i guess i've said uh, a lot already but I, my parting thoughts i guess would be to as sherry said that you know the the knowledge drop you got today was a, a tip of the iceberg i'm scratching the surface and uh, there, it's one of the things that it points out is some of the, the, the chasm, the, the siloing of information in our Western colonized structures, especially knowledge structures like universities, um, how um, they, they reinforce the separation of knowledge so that one, so that these knowledge systems are illegible to each other. Um, in these structures of domination and superiority and inferiority, but um, the the importance of of integrating social sciences and humanities into STEM uh, STEM disciplines is an, is can be the topic of a whole other conversation. And this is one of the problems that I see around the STEM disciplines is uh, in in students and people that that are heavy in in the science the the hard sciences not having the exposure to the histories and understanding um how what their positionality is and the trajectories the historical trajectories that led them to that place so um I, you know I, this is not an easy solution or an, you know an easy suggestion but I, you know i really think that this is there's a whole other conversation in here pedagogically about um, the importance of of infusing more humanities-based education so that we can have conversations about things like ethics and accountability, um, structural accountability in, in especially settler states. So uh, thank you again for uh, your invitation and for your attention and um, hope to encounter you all again. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Dina, for joining us today and Sherry and Darren for just all of the work that you do and, and making this possible. Um, you know, that last piece, you know, that you were talking about with the ethics, I have to say, as you know, being a non-Indigenous person, I am so grateful every time that I have Indigenous partners on a team in something that I'm doing because of that piece of bringing the, you know, the ethics and not leaving them at the door and having them be part of, you know, the integrity of what you're doing. I just appreciate that so much. So I think Darren gave a really good overview of the series and where we're going in, in the beginning. And um, 
and we're going to send we're going to send out an email um, definitely by next week um, with the recording and whenever we have that ready, but definitely by next week, as well as all the links and um, book titles and things that we've talked about today. I know there's a few people that I saw that haven't actually maybe signed up for the series. They might have been forwarded the link once we sent that out for the Zoom. So I would just recommend that if that's the case, just go ahead and actually register for the series on the on the website. Um, we can put it in the chat in a, in a second, just because you won't get the follow up information if you um, if you don't get yourself actually officially in to the um, email list that we're using. So yeah, with that, I just again want to thank um, our presenters, but also all of you for for joining us today and taking the time to um, to be in this with us. I'm I'm really excited for for where this conversation goes and to to get to know um, more of you as we continue along this journey. So thank you. Only one lem lem. Upchich. Chewily one upchich demnu. Have a wonderful rest of your day or evening.